According to a mobile touch research study, we touch, tap, swipe, or type on our phones more than 2,600 times per day. How many of you here want to stop for a moment? Just stop the bus. How many of you think things are going just a bit too fast? Imagine what it would be like if you could tap the brakes, stop the zips, the zings, the pings of the WhatsApps, the text messages, the TikToks, just for one day. We need to stop. Our gut even tells us we should stop. But we are so caught up in running, 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 doing, doing, doing on that treadmill of life. Everyone's running at pace and we have to keep up. We need to take a break. But to do what? To become more resilient. Doing is a verb. Verbs are about action. There's no direct verb for resilience. Resilience isn't about doing. Resilience is about being. In fact, resilience is a state of being. How would you describe resilience? I'm curious because there's over 47 different definitions for that word, and yet they all have something in common. They describe resilience as a capacity, a strength, a superpower, a state of being here and here. Being is the key to success in any environment. Harvard Business Review refers to achieving a state of being as a moment of greatness. Resilience, then, is the penultimate state of being for us to be successful, for us to be happy, to have the right frame of mind to become the very best version of ourselves. Today, I invite you on a journey one that flies above a landscape of our daily fast-paced lives. Let's stop just for a moment, the constant noise and notifications, and dive into the essence of resilience, a concept that is profoundly personal and yet universally relevant. My story of resilience starts on a farm in Simcoe, Ontario, Canada. Growing up as a little girl might not look like it, but I grew up on a farm. It's part of my identity and where I first learned to be resilient. I remember I was six years old. The sunlight sparkled over the barn, running through the cornfields with my dog Bobo, feeling so tiny because the corn was so tall and hoping not to run into a skunk. Later that night, the wind howled. The trees shook against the house. Little pebbles banged against the glass. I'd heard storms before, but nothing like this. The monsters outside, scarier than the monsters under the bed. The next morning, it was quiet, still, except for the sound of my mum crying, say, saying we could lose everything. Creeping to the top of the stairs, I know something is wrong. As I put my foot on the step and peer through the railings, I see Mom standing with Dad in the kitchen, his arms around her, tears streaming down her face. What does this mean? Halfway down the stairs, frozen, unable to move forward or run back to bed and hide, stuck in my own little storm, uncertain what to do. It takes every ounce of courage I have to walk down those stairs into the kitchen. When I get there, my dad says, good morning, Kelly. Take my hand, let's go outside. Holding this hand, this great big hand that's held me since I was born, he pushes open the door, and as we step outside, we are struck by a blast of wind so strong it stings my eyes. Standing on the porch, my heart sinks. The blue sky is there, but the corn is not. Looking out over the landscape, all we see is destruction. Walking in the fields together, feet crunching on hailstones as big as golf balls, the corn smashed to the ground, gone, wiped out. What are we going to do? 
my body shakes. I am gripped with fear, but my dad is tall and strong. And looking up into his big gray eyes, he said, Kelly, Mother Nature is teaching us a lesson here. There's been a storm, but don't worry. I know what to do. We are more resilient than this. Looking up at him, not even knowing what the word resilience means, that steadfast look on his face, his quiet, unwavering strength, his state of being gives me hope. This is the first time I learned to care about resilience. Seeing my mom cry, hearing my dad say, I know how to fix this. My life changed forever. This storm moment that could have been so tragic, learning that resilience isn't just about weathering the storm, but rebuilding in its wake, became my resilience moment and my life's calling. This early lesson stayed with me as I ventured far beyond the boundaries of our farm. My work's taken me all around the globe, helping countries and cultures in the Caribbean, Africa, and the Indian Ocean change and transform to become more resilient. In Mauritius, a small island with big dreams, I saw resilience in a new light. Here, amid the turquoise waters and lush landscapes, I learned that resilience can shape nations lift economies and forge new destinies. I arrived in the spring of 2016 to help build a national transformation strategy for a high income economy. Within the first three weeks, I had fallen in love with the country, the people, the vibe. We worked hard coming together to do what needed to be done to build a better economy and lift people out of poverty. We achieved our goal in just over two years. It was amazing. Then one night, a storm came and an oil tanker crashed on the reef in front of the nature reserve, home to the most endangered species, spilling three quarters of its load into the waters and onto the shores of beautiful Blue Bay. You've all seen pictures of oil spills. We've all seen pictures of oil-covered birds. What you're not ready for is the smell. The air thick with the acrid smell of oil. It stings your eyes. The waves sound gloopy, little blurps and bubbles coming onto the shore. This was a dire challenge. But within 12 hours, imagine what they saw. A response that was testament to the power of collective action. Picture this. Miles and miles of hair shimmering and glistening on top of the water, soaking up the oil. They say you learn something new every day. Did you know that human hair is the best natural absorbent for oil? You might not believe this, but literally one week before that oil spill, the University of Technology, Sydney, published a study which said, human hair is the best thing to use to soak up oil. All across the country, hair salons offered 50% discounts on haircuts. Men and women flocked to shear their locks with lineups as far as the eye could see. This response wasn't just unique, it was a symbol of unity and innovation. Their resilience ripped around the world, inspiring global solidarity. You know, in times of crisis, you find out who your friends are, and it's amazing how many joined in. Here in France, more than 3,000 salons collected hair. In Australia, they gathered up more than 10 tons of hair and flew it to Mauritius. They knew they had to act immediately. People didn't wait. They had a plan. They came together in community and collaboration. Some countries never recover from an oil spill. In Mauritius, they turned it around in a matter of weeks. They found their resilience. They created a collective state of being, woven from the hairs of shared experience and purposeful actions. Now, you know that resilience is a force that binds us, especially when faced with adversity. And I know this firsthand. While all of this amazing work was happening in Mauritius, 
tragedy struck for me personally. My husband, Peter, was diagnosed with cancer. Now, obviously, along the way, things happen that try to pull you off your path. If you are resilient, you stay on your path, no matter how hard it might be. My husband was dying, but he wanted me to have a plan for what we called the day after tomorrow, to keep going that next day when he would no longer be here. In a leap of faith, I enrolled in a doctorate program at the Paris School of Business. I remember it was December 2020. The first two weeks of classes were online because of COVID. The week the classes ended, Christmas week, on Christmas Day night, Peter, the love of my life, the man who encouraged me to do the impossible, who showed me how to be fearless and brave and walk through that storm called cancer, my biggest supporter, died. And if I hadn't had my plan for the day after tomorrow, my life might have taken a less resilient path. Grief is a storm you have to navigate. I faltered. I doubted myself. I said, I can't do this. And yet six months later, I sold the house we had built together, put everything into storage, packed two suitcases, and moved to Paris. It was a personal test of resilience. When you are heartbroken, it's hard to know who you are, what you want to do, and how you want to spend the rest of your life. It's hard, but we all know that diamonds do their best work under pressure. And so in this beautiful flat in Passy, in the 16th arrondissement, studying and researching and writing on the science of resilience, here in this city of lights, I find illumination on how people, countries, and companies can use resilience to grow and thrive, not just survive, but grow and thrive in times of uncertainty, change, and disruption. In this ever-evolving world, our approach to resilience needs to be dynamic and multifaceted. I discovered what I call the resilience trinity. First, a framework to bounce back after crises. Second, a plan to remain steadfast and stay on track in our daily pursuits. And third, a strategy to seize future opportunities. Each one of these elements is crucial, working in harmony to navigate the unpredictable tides of life. This, my friends, is the secret to achieving a resilient state of being. My personal journey, marked by profound loss and significant triumphs, has been shaped by the resilience trinity. My own resilience toolkit has a set of tools forged in the fires of experience and ready for you to use in your life. Number one is change. The world's a changing place. It's with us. It's constant. And sometimes we screw up. We can adapt. The next is learn to use what you have. Trust yourself. Listen to that inner voice. This is how you begin to build your inner resilience. The third is to act. You have to act. You can't freeze even when you are afraid. Find the courage to walk through the uncertainty because there is something better and more powerful on the other side. And the last, and this is tough, you need a plan for the day after tomorrow. You have to show up and be present because it matters to so many people. Now look around you. It's springtime already. Spring is about rebirth and renewal. The seasons teach us that the world is resilient. There's something comforting in this certainty, even when the world around us feels uncertain. We're almost in April. 
And that means a spring in our steps as we move towards May when things start to grow like the corn. Here, today, in March, I ask you to stand with me in unity and determination, stepping into a spring of new beginnings, marching forward together where every challenge has a seed of opportunity. We are the architects of our resilient futures. Now let's use this inspiration to change the world.